This is the last Sunday in the liturgical year, Christ the King Sunday, the reign of Christ. And we celebrate it with the Holy Gospel from the Gospel according to St. John, reading from the 18th chapter, beginning with the 33rd verse. Pilate went back into the palace. He summoned Jesus and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate responded, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your nation and its chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom doesn't originate from this world. If it did, my guards would fight so that I wouldn't have been arrested by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom isn't from here. So you are a king, Pilate said. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Please be seated. Grace be unto you in peace. From God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Not too very long ago, I had the privilege of returning after about a decade to Thailand to teach. And, you know, when you've been in a place for a number of years, you think that you know it. And when you've been away and you're going back to it, you assume you still know it. But many things have changed. On top of that, you've forgotten some things. And that was the case when I went back to Thailand. I fully expected there to be a lot of heat, and there was. I fully expected there to be a lot of people, and there were. I fully expected to be taller than most of them, and I was. But there were some things that I had forgotten. My job there at this particular conference, which was, I think, in 2012, was to participate in a conference that was to prepare a bunch of monks to participate in the Parliament of the World's Religions. They are very deeply faithful people, but they don't know very much about Western traditions, about Christianity and Judaism, even about Islam. They know very little. They know about Buddhism. They know about Hinduism, but not much else. So this was kind of a, uh, a helpful little update for them, if you like. And, and uh, because I taught in the university system there, very often when they have such things, they invite me to come back. And so I went back to teach them. Now, we had one day off in the middle of this thing. It was about, I think there was about two-week session. And in the middle of this thing, I, I decided that I was going to do something that I know that I enjoyed doing when I lived there. Because I remember about Thailand something really cool about the theaters. You can go into the theaters there, and in many of them, I think that somebody told me it's possible here too in one or two, but in many of them you go there and you place an order for your, your snacks and your, your beverages and things, and they serve you at your chair. You can choose your chair and you tell them what you want to eat, and they bring the food right to you, and it's really cool. And you can actually upgrade your seats. There's there's recliners, there's things that are like uh, love seats and sofas. There's all kinds of seating, and I was looking forward to this experience. But I forgot something. And the thing that I forgot was that the monks love to go to movies. Now, this is important because they, they can't go on their own unless someone invites them. It's just not appropriate. And so when they heard that I was going to this movie, they wanted to go. And it was a special movie. I was looking forward to it. It was the the fairly recent edition of Star Trek that came out. And I wanted to see it partly because I like Star Trek, but also because it was coming out in Asia 10 days before it came out here. So I was in a competition with my boys to see it. And I was going to see it first. But then I had this teensy little problem of 18 monks who wanted to go with me. And so I invited them. So I went to the theater with 18 saffron-robed fellows to go to this movie, and they were delighted. 
And so we went in there and we got all of our seats and we took up literally an entire section of the theater and were rather a bright spectacle in saffron robes. I wasn't wearing a saffron robe. But it was a wonderful experience to be there in the theater again and to um, wait for this movie to start. It was a little bit louder than I remember. The, the commercials were louder and longer. It was a, a vibrant experience. And when all of this was about done, and I assumed that the movie was about to begin, all of a sudden, everybody stood up. I had forgotten one important thing, that before every movie that is shown in Thailand, the people stand for the anthem for the king, to show respect to the king. They have a photo image of the king on the screen, and they play uh, this music, which is kind of a catchy tune once you get used to it. But it's done after, or rather before, every screening of any movie that comes out. And I had forgotten. Wonderful respect that these people have for their king. But it made me think of how we all understand the notion of kings, especially on a day like today, Christ the king. Nowadays, in most countries, when we talk about kings, we're talking about constitutional monarchies, where the king is typically respected, in some cases loved, like the king of Thailand is absolutely revered and loved as a very important person. And I know this because one time I accidentally, a coin had gotten away on me and I was going to step on it to catch it before it went too far. And that was a mistake because the image of the king is on the coin. The king is very, very respected. And he can, if he chooses to, subtly influence what the government does. And that's important because the governments in some countries are very often very corrupt and the king's influence can be very helpful. But constitutional monarchies are limited in what they can do. They can't control or rule as they once may have done. But in Jesus' day, we're talking about a different kind of king. In those days, kings were born to a father who had been a king, perhaps, and they were raised up into a position of privilege. And they retained their position of privilege and their kingship usually by the use of violent means, using force and power to overwhelm any that would be in opposition. There were, of course, times where there were kings who would accede to the throne, not through the normal accession to the throne, but rather by overtaking the previous king. They would simply assassinate the king that was in power and through violent means overthrow the kingdom and take over that kingdom for themselves. And so the kings would change. Kings were people who were understood to be absolutely ready to use violence whenever necessary. This was the kind of king that Pilate's asking about when he says to Jesus, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, in a rather curious exchange, we all know this story as being one that we tell at Easter time, but in this story he says, how do you know this? Did somebody tell you about me, or do you know this on your own? And Pilate says, I'm not a Jew, but your people, even your chief priests, handed you over to me for punishment. What did you do? You who are supposed to be the king, and your people are turning on you like this? Where's your control, man? Jesus said, I'm not that kind of king. My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom was from this world, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Jesus understood the whole notion of kingship and the kingdom very differently. For the kingdom from which Jesus is coming is not a kingdom that is won ever through violence. It's not a kingdom that is ever won through the use of power, through the use of force. The kingdom of God is marked by two things, and two things only. Peace and love. Now we have had people in this world who proclaim such things, but they're not necessarily given that much credit. They're admired by many. 
but not necessarily given as much credit as they deserve. For if you listen to what they have to say, their stories are very compelling. For example, Martin Luther King spoke about peace often. He spoke about nonviolent ways to resist corruption, nonviolent ways to resist the kinds of pressures and forces that would corrupt human life, nonviolent ways to change things that just weren't fair, to change things that were not just, to create a system of equality and justice compelling indeed. But you know, I come from a tradition, from a heritage as do we all, where we are taught that there are two hands in the world, the government and God's, and these hands work differently. There are times, in order for there to be control, that we turn over control of the way in which life works to our authorities, to our governments to our police and to our military, and we expect them to live up to a certain standard so that we might live in peace, so that we might live well, so that we might live with a certain modicum of justice. And to greater or lesser extents, we achieve that. And so that we leave questions of violence and dealing with violence, questions of power and the use of power to these authorities to whom we've given the power. But for those of us who are children of the kingdom of God, we are called upon to live a little bit differently. Even when our splankna, our guts, tell us that we must react, that we must react very differently. Last week we spoke of the terrible things that happened 10 days ago in Paris how that profound evil can enter into the world, we don't know why. We don't know what can be done about it, but since that time, other things have happened. In Bamako, in Mali, an attack on a hotel. 26 people killed for no reason. And even somewhat, uh, I was gonna say closer to home, but more poignant for me in some ways was an attack by the Boko Haram in Cameroon, about a long ways away from where we ever work, about 800 kilometers away, but nonetheless, six to 10 people were killed by a suicide bomber for no reason at all. And when we hear these stories of injustice, when we hear these stories of injustice that somehow or other touch us, And I don't know about you, what are the things that touch you, but for me, I've been to some of the places in Paris that had been attacked. For me, I have a sensitivity to what goes on in African countries because I've lived there. Most especially for Cameroon, to see that kind of evil coming in from another country makes me angry. It makes me want to react in a way that represents an exercise of power to crush those who would use their power against innocent people. But that is not what I am called upon to do. Brothers and sisters, we have to have confidence in our king. King Jesus has this under control. We have our authorities to whom we entrust our safety, and our peaceful living. We have our authorities to whom we entrust all these things, and we must let them work without succumbing to the temptation of exercising or encouraging violence ourselves. No, brothers and sisters, our role is to model the words and the work of our king, who proclaimed peace, and who loved even those who would kill him. This is a very hard thing for us to internalize. It's a very hard thing for us to understand. But on this last Sunday of the church year, we must think about what it is that Jesus did. Jesus turned everything upside down for when he was challenged, when he was attacked, when he was criticized, when he was 
crucified. Jesus submitted and exercised only love and encouraged peace. And this is what we are called on to do. For if we do this, if we do this consistently and persistently, there will be successes. For the more people in this world that know and understand and love peace as do we, the more peace there will be. Violence only begets violence. Martin Luther King used to say that darkness cannot be overcome by darkness. Only light can overcome darkness. Hatred cannot be overcome by hatred. Only love can overcome the hatred that's in this world. These are words of wisdom that we would do well to remember. And so I encourage you to go out from this place. And in the face of the evil that exists in the world, in the face of the kingdoms of this world that would use force and violence to achieve their ends, to achieve their means. Remember that you, as a child of God, are called upon to live in peace, are called upon to share love, are called upon to serve. Because in that loving and in that serving, you will change the world. You are God's hands in the world, brothers and sisters. And if you love, the message of love will be spread out. The message of love will become known. And the need for violence will diminish. So go out from this place. Spread the word of the king. That we must love one another. For if we do, we encourage peace. And in the face of such hatred, we must speak louder. In the face of such violence, we must speak more persistently for God's kingdom to become the focus of all of our lives. Speak love, brothers and sisters, for that's what our king would do. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks that you bring us together this day so that we might worship and glorify you, our King. Help us to understand and to embrace the fact that you are our King, not in the way of the world, but in a way that changes the world. For you encourage us to live in peace and encourage us to love one another, thereby being able to overcome all those things that would separate us. In a world that seems to know no love, help us to love. In a world that seems to push away peace, help us to bring peace. Help us to serve all of your children, for these are the people for whom you died. And grant us grace as we do it. In your name we pray.